All right, I just checked my email. I just made sure that there wasn't any schoolwork that I had to do so we can read a little bit more today. So let's read some more of Holes by Lewis Sacker. We left off with Stanley trying to decide if he should go back for the shovel or not. Zero isn't doing very well. He just made a confession, something about the shoes. I don't really know how that was possible, um, but we've got some more to read. Look, we are headed towards the end of this book. I think we've got less than 100 pages left, but this is a long book for us. Let's see how many pages we have. We are on page 176, and we have to read until two, page 233. Somebody do the math quickly. It's about 24 and 33, and about 57 more pages. This many more. This part is all advertising in the back. So we've got this much more. We're almost done. Maybe next week we'll be picking a new book. All right, chapter 40. When Stanley found the onion the night before, he didn't question how it had come to be there. He ate it gratefully. But now as he sat gazing at the big thumb and the meadow full of flowers, he couldn't help but wonder about it. If there was one wild onion, there could be more. He intertwined his fingers and tried to rub out the pain. Then he bent down and dug up another flower, this time pulling up the entire plant, including the root. Onions! Fresh, hot, sweet onions, Sam called as Mary Lou pushed the cart down Main Street. Eight cents a dozen. We just jumped back in time again. Do you remember when we were jumping back in time earlier in the book? Huh. Sam had a cart that sold onions and... Was it a donkey, a horse, named Mary Lou? Wasn't that the name of that boat? Maybe I'll just stop reading and we'll think about it for a while. No, let's keep reading. Onions, fresh, hot, sweet onions, Sam called as Mary Lou pulled the cart down Main Street. Eight cents a dozen. It was a beautiful spring morning. The sky was painted pale blue and pink, the same color as the lake and the peach trees along its shore. Mrs. Gladys Tennyson was wearing just her nightgown and robe as she came running down the street after Sam. Mrs. Tennyson was normally a very proper woman who never went out in public without dressing up in fine clothes and a hat. So it was quite surprising to the people of Green Lake to see her running past them. Sam, she shouted. Whoa, Mary Lou, said Sam, stopping his mule and cart. It was a mule, not a donkey. Good morning, Mrs. Tennyson, he said. How's little Becca doing? Gladys Tennyson was all smiles. I think she's going to be all right. The fever broke about an hour ago, thanks to you. I'm sure the good Lord and Doc Hawthorne deserve most of the credit. The good Lord, yes, agreed Miss Tennyson, but not Dr. Hawthorne. That quack wanted to put leeches on her stomach. Leeches! My word! He said they would suck out the bad blood. Now you tell me. How would a leech know good blood from bad blood? I wouldn't know, said Sam. It was your onion tonic, said Mrs. Tennyson. That's what saved her. Other townspeople made their way to the cart. Good morning, Gladys, said Hattie Parker. Don't you look lovely this morning? Several people snickered. Good morning, Hattie, Mrs. Tennyson replied. Does your husband know you're parading about in your bedclothes, Hattie asked. There were more Snickers. When they say Snickers, they don't mean the candy bar. They mean they're laughing. <laughs> That's a Snicker, like when you're kind of laughing behind. You are sort of making fun of somebody. That's a Snicker. My husband knows exactly where I am and how I am dressed. Thank you, said Mrs. Tennyson. We have both been up all night and half the morning with Rebecca. She almost died from stomach sickness. It seems she ate some bad meat. Hattie's face flushed. Her husband, Jim Parker, was the butcher. It made my husband and me sick as well, said Mrs. Tennyson, but it nearly killed Becca. With her, What with her being so young, Sam saved her life. 
wasn't me, said Sam. It was the onions. I'm glad Becca's all right, Hattie said contritely. I keep telling Jim he needs to wash his knives, said Mr. Pike, who owned the general store. Hattie Parker excused herself, then turned quickly and walked away. Tell Becca that when she feels up to it, come by the store for a piece of candy, said Mr. Pike. Thank you. I'll do that. Before returning home, Mrs. Tennyson bought a dozen onions from Stam. Sam. She gave him a dime and told him to keep the change. I don't take charity, Sam told her, but if you want to buy a few extra onions for Mary Lou, I'm sure she'd appreciate it. All right, then, said Mrs. Tennyson. Give me my change in onions. Sam gave Mrs. Tennyson an additional three onions, and she fed them one at a time to Mary Lou. She laughed as the old donkey ate them out of her hand. Hmm. I wonder if those are the same onions that Stanley just found at Big Thumb. Everything seems to be very connected here. Are you making the connections? Let's keep reading. Stanley and Zero slept off and on for the next two days, ate onions, all they wanted, and splashed dirty water into their mouths. In the late afternoon, Big Thumb gave them shade. Stanley tried to make the hole deeper, but he really needed the shovel. His efforts just seemed to stir up the mud and make the water dirtier. Zero was sleeping. He was still very sick and weak, but the sleep and the onions seemed to be doing him some good. Stanley was no longer afraid that he would die soon. Still, he didn't want to go for the shovel while Zero was asleep. He didn't want him to wake up and think he'd been deserted. He waited for Zero to open his eyes. I think I'll go look for the shovel, Stanley said. I'll wait here, Zero said feebly, as if he had any other choice. Stanley headed down the mountain. The sleep and the onions had done him a lot of good as well. He felt strong. It was a fairly easy to follow the trail he had made two days earlier. There were a few places where he wasn't sure he was going the right way, but it just took a little bit of searching before he found the trail again. He went quite a ways down the mountain, but still didn't find the shovel. He looked back up toward the top of the mountain. He must have walked right past it, he thought. There was no way he could have carried Zero all the way up from here. Still, he headed downward just in case. He came to a bare spot between two large patches of weeds and sat down to rest. Now he definitely had gone too far, he decided. He was tired out from walking down the hill. It would have been impossible to have carried Zero up the hill from here, especially after walking all day with no food or water. The shovel must be buried in some weeds. Before starting back up, he took one last look around in all directions. He saw a large indentation in the weeds a little further down the mountain. It didn't seem likely that the shovel could be there, but he'd already come this far. There, lying in some tall weeds, he found the shovel and the sack of jars. He was amazed. He wondered if the shovel and sack might have rolled down the hill, but none of the jars were broken, except the one which had broken earlier. And if they had rolled down the hill, it was doubtful he would have found the sack and shovel side by side. On his way back up the mountain, Stanley had to sit down and rest several times. It was a long, hard climb. That's the end of chapter 40. Let's read some more. Chapter 41. Zero's condition continued to improve. Stanley slowly peeled an onion. He liked eating them one layer at a time. The water hole was now almost as large as the holes he had dug back at Camp Green Lake. It contained almost two feet of murky water. Stanley had dug it all himself. Zero had offered to help, but Stanley thought it better for Zero to save his strength. It was a lot harder to dig in water than it was in a dry lake. Stanley was surprised that he himself hadn't gotten sick, either from the sploosh, the dirty water, or from living on onions. He used to get sick quite a lot back at home. Both boys were barefoot. 
They had washed their socks. All their clothes were very dirty, but their socks were definitely the worst. They didn't dip their socks into the hole, afraid to contaminate the water. Instead, they filled the jars and poured the water over their dirty socks. I didn't go to the homeless shelter very often, Zero said, just if the weather was really bad. I'd have to find someone to pretend to be my mom. If I'd just gone by myself, they would have asked me a bunch of questions. If they'd found out I didn't have a mom, they would have made me a ward of the state. What's a ward of the state? Zero smiled. I don't know, but I didn't like the sound of it. Stanley remembered Mr. Pendansky telling the warden that Zero was a ward of the state. He wondered if Zero knew he'd become one. I liked sleeping outside, said Zero. I used to pretend I was a Cub Scout. I always wanted to be a Cub Scout. I'd see them at the park in their blue uniforms. I was never a Cub Scout, said Stanley. I wasn't good at social stuff like that. Kids made fun of me because I was fat. I liked the blue uniforms, said Zero. Maybe I wouldn't have liked being a Cub Scout. Stanley shrugged one shoulder. My mother was once a Girl Scout, said Zero. I thought you said you didn't have a mother. Everybody has to have a mother. Well, yeah, I know that. She said she once won a prize for selling the most Girl Scout cookies, said Zero. She was real proud of that. Stanley peeled off another layer of his onions. We always took what we needed, said Zero. When I was little, I didn't even know it was stealing. I don't remember when I found out, but we just took what we needed, never more. So when I saw the shoes on display in the shelter, I just reached in the glass case and took them. Clyde Livingston shoes, said, asked Stanley. I didn't know they were his. I, I just thought they were somebody's old shoes. It was better to take somebody's old shoes, I thought, than to steal a pair of new ones. I didn't know they were famous. There was a sign, but of course I couldn't read it. Then the next thing I know, everybody is making this big deal about how the shoes are missing. It was kind of funny in a way. The whole place was going crazy. There I was wearing the shoes and everybody's running around saying, what happened to the shoes? The shoes are gone. I just walked out the door. No one noticed me. When I got outside, I ran around the corner and immediately took off the shoes. I put them on top of a parked car. I remember they smelled really bad. Yeah, those were them, said Stanley. Did they fit you? Pretty much. Stanley remembered being surprised at Clyde Livingston's small shoe size. Stanley's shoes were bigger. Clyde Livingston had small, quick feet. Stanley's feet were big and slow. I should have just kept them, said Zero. I'd already made it out of the shelter and everything. I ended up getting arrested the next day when I tried to walk out of a shoe store with a new pair of sneakers. If I had just kept those old smelly sneakers, then neither of us would be here right now. It's the end of 41. So he really did take Clyde Livingston sneakers. But how did they... How, how did... He put them on top of a car. They were flying, and uh, I don't understand. But things are starting to come together, aren't they? Chapter 42. Let's read one more chapter. Zero became strong enough to help dig the hole. When he finished, it was over six feet deep. He filled the bottom with rocks to help separate the water from the dirt. He was still the best hole digger around. This is the last hole I will ever dig, he declared, throwing down the shovel. Stanley smiled. He wished it were true, but he knew they had no choice but to eventually return to Camp Green Lake. They couldn't live on onions forever. They had been completely around Big Thumb. It was like a giant sundial. They followed the shade. They were able to see out in all directions. There was no place to go. The mountain was surrounded by desert. Zero stared at Big Thumb. It must have a hole in it, he said, filled with water. You think? Where else could the water be coming from, Zero asked. Water doesn't run uphill. Stanley bit into an onion. It didn't burn his eyes or nose, and in fact, he no longer noticed a particularly strong taste. He remembered when he had first carried Zero up the hill, how the air had smelled bitter it was the smell of thousands of onions growing and rotting and sprouting. Now, 
He didn't smell a thing. How many onions do you think we've eaten? He asked. Zero shrugged. I don't even know how long we've been here. I'd say about a week, said Stanley. And we probably each eat about 20 onions a day, so that's... 280 onions, said Zero. Stanley smiled. I bet we really stink. Two nights later, Stanley lay awake, staring up at the star-filled sky. He was too happy to fall asleep. He knew he had no reason to be happy. He had heard or read somewhere that right before a person freezes to death, he suddenly feels nice and warm. He wondered if perhaps he was experiencing something like that. It occurred to him that he couldn't remember the last time he felt happiness. It wasn't just being sent to Camp Green Lake that had made his life miserable. Before that, he'd been unhappy at school, where he had no friends, and bullies like Derek Dunn picked on him. No one liked him, and the truth was he didn't especially like himself. He liked himself now. He wondered if he was delirious. He looked over at Zero sleeping near him, Zero's face was lit in the starlight, and there was a special flower petal in front of his nose that moved back and forth as he breathed. It reminded Stanley of something out of a cartoon. Zero breathed in, and the petal was drawn up, almost touching his nose. Zero breathed out, and the petal moved toward his chin. It stayed on Zero's face for an amazingly long time before it fluttered off to the side. Stanley considered placing it back in front of Zero's nose, but it wouldn't be the same. It seemed like Zero had lived at Camp Green Lake forever, but as Stanley thought about it now, he realized that Zero must have gotten there no more than a month or two before him. Zero was actually arrested a day later, but Stanley's trial kept getting delayed because of baseball. He remembered what Zero said a few days before. If Zero had just kept the shoes, then neither of them would be here right now. As Stanley stared at the glittering night sky, he thought there was no place he would rather be. He was glad Zero put the shoes on the parked car. He was glad they fell from the overpass and hit him on the head. When the shoes first fell from the sky, he remembered thinking that destiny had struck him. Now he thought so again. It was more than coincidence. It had to be destiny. Maybe they wouldn't have to return to Camp Green Lake, he thought. Maybe they could make it past the camp, then follow the dirt road back to civilization. They could fill the sack with onions and the three jars with water, and he had his canteen as well. They could refill their jars and canteen at the camp, maybe sneak into the kitchen and get some food. He doubted any counselors were still on guard. Everyone had to think they were dead. Buzzard food. It would mean living the rest of his life as a fugitive. The police would always be after him. At least he could call his parents and tell them he was alive but he couldn't go visit them in case the police were watching the apartment. Although, if everyone thought he was dead, they wouldn't bother to watch the apartment. He would have to somehow get a new identity. Now I'm really thinking crazy, he thought. He wondered if a crazy person wonders if he's crazy. But even as he thought this, an even crazier idea kept popping into his head. He knew it was too crazy to even consider. Still, if he was going to be a fugitive for the rest of his life, it would help to have some money. Perhaps a treasure chest full of money. You're crazy, he told himself. Besides, just because he found a lipstick container with KB on it, that didn't mean there was treasure buried there. It was crazy. It was all part of his crazy feeling of happiness. Or maybe it was destiny. He reached over and shook Zero's arm. Hey, Zero, he whispered. Huh? Zero muttered, Zero, wake up. What? What is it? You want to dig one more hole? Stanley asked him. That's the end of 42, and I am going to stop there. We're going to have to wait until the next time to find out what he is talking about, what he is thinking. This all seems so very crazy, but thank you for joining me, Miss Tho, Reading Holes by Lewis Sacker. We'll read a little bit more next time. Have a good day.